Welcome to the day two of the Virtual Mining Summit. And we start with a Wi-Fi update session presented by Ian Prosik from our Enterprise Business Unit. Over to you, Ian. So, um, so I'm gonna cover the Wi-Fi component, but I did wanna spend a little bit of time up front just discussing kind of the regulatory and, and protocol changes that have happened over the last uh, well, year, a couple of years, and, and things that you need to be aware of that uh, I think are fundamentally game changing. Um, as Wi Fi at the Phi layer becomes more and more like cellular, um, which is, uh, I think, a, a good thing. So, you probably have seen something like this uh, in recent uh, talks. I'm not going to belabor the point, but uh, if you hear Wi Fi 6, that word is interchangeable with uh, 802.11ax, uh, the uh, Wi Fi alliance, which is responsible for the logo you see at the top right is now referring to Wi-Fi and its generations. So hence we are at number six now. Um, the the main thing that Wi-Fi 6 uh, that tries to solve for is an efficiency problem that we have in large high-scale networks. And I think anybody who's um, ran Wi-Fi at scale can understand the consequences of poor efficiency, right? You get high latency, you get high jitter, and this means that as you add more things to your network, um, you have challenges with uh, keeping SLAs and, and services running that are time sensitive. Uh, and when you look at the actual, let's say you do a packet capture out on the air right? in your environment, you put a sniffer AP up in the environment, you take a look at what's going on, you'd be surprised uh, that the vast majority of the packets on the air, especially in a lot of uh, real-time applications, aren't big, right? A lot of small packets. And Wi-Fi is inherently inefficient uh, up until Wi-Fi 6 at handling lots of small frames, right? Where it's really good and set up for, for, for big data transmissions, but small things as, uh, you know, multicast messages or all machine position messages or um, our GPS RTKs and things like this that are bytes uh, suck up a lot of airtime. So Wi-Fi 6 and, uh, and OFDMA specifically on the, at the file layer is trying to solve for this. And here's a chart here actually from the IEEE on, uh, on helping to explain the penalty you pay um, in 11AC, so Wi-Fi 5 and before, as you start to load up a network. And this should be familiar to anybody that's kind of had experience with TCP once you get above about 80% utilization most of your frames become actually retransmissions and then you just fall off uh, off of a curve. And so you can typically hit this with um, on a typical AP with 25, 30 clients. You're, you're taking a massive penalty and it's nonlinear. So this this becomes a problem. And uh, and this is, the I think, the crux of the bulk of the issues that we have. So the, the result here is you get more and more clients on the network. You get contention increasing, which increases back off time, right? We have this randomized contention window and then you have uh, you know, your latency building. So what was a network that was operating really, really well with say uh, 15, 20 clients on an AP uh, and, you know, maybe 20, 30 megabits per second, you drive that client count up higher, you start to start to see impacts real quick. So there's a bunch of sub enhancements in Wi-Fi 6. One thing I'll mention off the top, if it's not uh, obvious is this is the first time in a while we've gone back, the industry has gone back to actually deal with the 2.4 spectrum. So 2.4 took a back seat for the last couple of years as we went through 11AC, uh, wave one and wave two. And as most of you are aware, 2.4, especially in uh, from a propagation perspective, has some advantages over five gigs. Obviously we pay the penalty of the lack of the number of channels, but signals go further down and down lower in frequency. So it has been the common denominator out there for non-backhaul applications. And, um, and so Wi-Fi 6 goes back and solves the problem on 2.4. So all the enhancements we're talking about here aren't just for five gigs, they are 2.45. Uh, and you'll see six gigs here in a minute. So high level, right? We, we move the file layer from a, a completely uh, kind of hub-based model, if you will, a CSMA model uh, to, a, to a model that is essentially time and frequency division, uh, which, is, which is nice, right? This is nothing new, but uh, in Wi-Fi it is. Uh, we have the ability to transmit uh, downstream and upstream to multiple clients at the same time, right, in, in, in different frequency slots, different resource units, which again is parallelism, and that helps us with the efficiency challenge. And um, and then the last couple of pieces here really are uh, around, you know, the higher bit rate stuff, which in mining isn't always the, the case. You're not always real close to the AP, but in situations where you can go faster, why not go faster? 
right? Again, that just helps everybody else. And I always like to look at things kind of visually. So here's a little picture of, of kind of a, of a of a channel, right? So this might be your your 20 megahertz frequency here, and here's your time on on the x-axis. And if you look at what what OFDMA is doing here, is we're actually dividing this frequency up into multiple blocks uh, called resource units. And what this is doing, this is our or our use. Um, is we can actually assign our use dynamically. This is all automatic happening at the radio level down to individual devices in the system. So you can see different colors here that symbolizes different devices all talking to the AP up or downstream at different times, uh, sorry, at the same time as, as we go on, but they're divided in frequency. And the, 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 the width of these allocations, these are used is much narrower than the 20 meg channel you're operating in. So the side benefit of that from an outdoor operations perspective is I have a smaller channel width or smaller amount of RF that I have to look at. My link budget goes up because my my uh, receiver sensitivity goes up and it's a substantial increase. So at very low bit rates, I can go a hell of a lot further than I could have before in, in a non OFDMA world where this would have been a 20 megahertz wide channel all the way across. Um, for some of the battery powered or, or really low power applications, uh, Wi-Fi 6 introduces something that, that is near and dear to Laura's application, and Kevin will touch on some of the battery powered aspects of Laura, but target wake time, which is the ability for us to tell a device that's battery powered to just kind of sleep for a while and wake up and send your frames later, and there's an agreement between the AP and the, and the IoT device about that. Uh, we have the ability in the standard to actually send uh, copies of information into, into different parts of the spectrum. So from a from a selective fading or from a, a interference perspective, if I have redundant transmissions in two different parts of the spectrum, if I lose a copy of it here, you see the little purple dot, I can get the other one and I can still demodulate the signal, which is kind of cool. And I really harped on this at the beginning, but this is supported across both bands, right? This is two, four, and five gigs. The last piece here is something we call or is known as a guard interval. And this is what the inter interframe spacing uh, or inter symbol spacing in, in uh and the transmission, uh, this increases <clears throat> up to 3.2 microseconds in Wi-Fi 6 from 400 nanoseconds in 11N and prior. Uh, and this allows us a dynamic, it's flexible, but it allows us to handle multi-path better. So you can think of reverb in a large room, right? You clap your hands and it takes a second for that to die down. And if you don't have a tight room with, with, with insulation and you send the next transmission into that room, they start to overlap. And that's really hard for a receiver to decode. With a guard interval, it's like the delay time. So we built before we send the next transmission. So this is, this is an added advantage uh, substantially over prior standards um, and allows us to be flexible. Even in situations where we're doing dop Doppler shift, lots high, like high speed mobility or higher speed mobility. So picture is worth a thousand words. Here's another example of how this plays out. From a um, uh, from an end user device perspective, so from a data uh, or or voice perspective, what the latency curve looks like as I load up a network, and you can see the blue line here is referring to uh, 11AC, which is the prior standard, and pretty much how Wi-Fi has worked up until this point, and uh, you can see the difference in how 11AX plays here. I don't have my eye on the chat window, but if there's anything that comes through, and me just uh, shoot it by a uh, Roland and team. Yeah, we haven't seen anything yet. Cool. Uh, people are being shy today. Either that or they're no, no mesmerized problem. by your wisdom or something. Get, I don't a, know. get a free car if you send some uh, questions. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hear some so, questions for sure. <laughs> um, the, uh, the another couple pieces here just also uh, around the data rates. So um, we didn't really talk a lot about the high speed data rates, but in, in mining world, that's not always the, the, the big deal. It's the low speed stuff that I think is interesting here. So as you look at the at the at the, at the very lowest speeds, we can actually go down to four megabits per second here, which is kind of cool. And then another little piece that I'll mention on or talk about is just the uh, the, the spectrum news and the spectrum update here. And right now, this is an indoor or underground conversation in the six gigahertz band. But the backstory here is that kind of we've been running out of spectrum for a while in Wi-Fi. Um, and unlicensed transmissions in general uh, in 2.4 and 5 gigs. Uh, I mean, we, we exhausted two, four years ago. 5 gigs is generally pretty heavily consumed, especially for point to point, point to multi point backhaul operations. It's very challenging uh, to find clear spectrum in very crowded areas, especially if you're nestled up next to another operator. Uh, that's, uh, that's always interesting. Um, so the FCC drove this conversation a few years back to try and bring. Um, the six gigahertz band to fruition. Now, as I mentioned, this is not currently uh, a band that supports outdoor operations. 
Uh, there's a number of things that need to be done from a regulatory and frequency use perspective to do that. Uh, that should come over the next couple of years. Uh, but for indoor or underground operations where we're not necessarily bounded by those restrictions, something that you need to certainly consider. Um, because anytime you get 1200 megahertz of spectrum thrown your way for free, it's, it's worthwhile considering. <laughs> so, um, and, and you'll see that the devices we make, whether it be Wi Fi or curb in the future, things like this, will start supporting these bands, right? Because th this is, this is agnostic of the modulation and the. And the protocol you run on it, it's, it's there for unlicensed services. Uh, so, when you think about your strategy around multi service network and, um. Integration or handoff with LTE and that kind of thing, it's really important to consider, hey, what do I have available at my disposal to make that. Application the best possible, uh, and so we all know where Wi Fi strong points are as far as close in coverage or high density coverage. Um, this just makes tons of sense. So the net of this is that in in uh, in the indoor space or underground space, uh, we're going to have substantial amount of channel capacity here available. So we just launched our first six gigahertz uh, access points, um, literally a couple weeks back. Uh, and this is just going to continue moving forward. So 59 new 20 meg channels is nothing to sneeze at. Um, last couple of things here, just on the product side, some updates. I mean, a lot of people undergoing migration. Um, a lot of people, you know, obviously supply chain challenges here are, are real. People have been looking at moving to 11 AX or Wi-Fi 6 and held up with things. Just wanted to set the, the, this, the, the kind of the bar or the level as far as where we're at right now. Uh, it shouldn't come as news to anybody that we've had to uh, end of life the, the 1572 two years ago. Uh, there's some people that have still um, still had some extensions in the mining space for that product, uh, but components are components. And so you're not going to see a new 1572 going out the door. Uh, 1542, which is an 11 AC wave two uh, radio. Uh, we announced in a sale on that in May last year. Uh, sorry, of, of, of this year end of hardware sale. Um, and, and with 1562, which is kind of out there, we did a number of operators running 1562. We don't have anything posted right now. But you should anticipate this. Uh, certainly this year, some point we're going to make an announcement on the 1562. And that really gives us one option from an outdoor AXAP right now. Um, on the far right hand side, you see the 9124, right? Which is kind of our sing all singing, all dancing. You can consider this as a replacement of the 1572. So if you're a 1572 shop and you've been running that AP for a while, uh, this is the guy that uh, you would want to look at moving forward. Um, and I'll just touch on the IW3702. The IW3702 is kind of like our Energizer Bunny. Uh, the safety's been around for a while. It just keeps going and going. Um, yeah, yeah, we're always working on new stuff. Um, and so stay tuned. Maybe later this summer there'll be some announcements, but uh, we still have plans to support this uh, well into the future with iOS XE, uh, whereas some of our other older iOS-based APs have dropped off. So uh, not, to, not to worry, this guy's still, still a going concern. Uh, just a couple of pictures here. I'm a big fan of pictures of gear and hardware, so you can understand what's really going on. Uh, 9124, uh, as I mentioned, is is the 1572's replacement. The takeaway here, if there is one, um, this AP has um, two 5 gig radios and a 2.4 radio. So you can see at the top, we've got four RF ports, and the point of that is to have the ability of doing uh, serial backhaul, so I can have uplink and downlink on different channels. So I'm not halving my latency, or sorry, halving my throughput and doubling my latency at every hop. So I can have serial backhaul operations if I want to do stuff like that, or I want to have two different sectors on five gigs. Um, and then of course we keep the 2.4 radio running available on the bottom slot. We do fiber in, we do copper in, PoE in, DC in. The temperature range is as you'd expect, uh, wide ranging temperature. And then the last two pictures here, uh, just kind of updates to our mesh protocol. So we've been doing some work over the last few years um, on mesh and some enhancements to mesh. I mentioned the serial backhaul application. Um, this is probably the largest change uh, where we actually can have uh, uplink and downlink communications taking place in the same chassis at the same time. Um, and so you see a picture of what that looks like here where we actually have um, you know, one one slot here, and then we we flip over and use the second slot, the, the other two ports on the radio to to extend the chain downstream, and we do that without having to do store and forward. So we're not sacrificing any bandwidth on those hops. This is automated through radio, radio resource management. So the configuration of the chain and the frequency that it's using is is something that is is set up automatically. 
Um, and then the last thing here I'll touch on is just another enhancement that's come actually come from mining operators is I want to do upstream failure detection. So let's say, for example, I've got a root access point out in the field and that root AP is behind a microwave link. Maybe it's got an upstream, you know, red line, or proxim, or ubiquity, whatever your uplink might be um, sitting behind this. Uh, I might want to have that uh, that be aware of a link failure. So that its Ethernet port might still be up, but the uplink has faded out, or I've had a loss of comms um, one hop away. Well, we can actually run um, ping tests now between automated between the AP and the uplink infrastructure. So I could typically ping my gateway, and if everything is great, you keep running. But if we have a ping failure here, when we see that the gateway is not available on the wired uplink, what will actually happen here is that AP will, within short order. Send a message to the downstream mesh saying, hey, I've lost my uplink. You need to find another parent. So we send a deauthentication frame out to the mesh and that triggers the maps downstream to flip over and find another parent. This is incredibly useful in situations so you don't have black holes in your network where devices can still associate to APs that have no path to an upstream network. Um, so that's also possible uh, in a scenario where you cross a latency threshold. So that's the last point of this is we can do this based on loss of comms altogether or if a latency threshold is, is surpassed. And uh, and that's, you know, if you get a really poor performing wireless uplink or something like that in the, in the, in the, in the system, you may want to bail off uh, and, and have another path out. And it does the same thing. It sends the D off down and, and uh, the maps will reconverge. This is all supported in the 9124 and NR1562. This is not supported in iOS based APs like the 1572. And this is in 17.7, iOS XE 17.7. And so, um, I think that's the end of my little quick update here in 20 minutes. Hey, why, why? If there's any questions, Roland. Yeah, Ian, before we hop over to uh, to Kevin, a uh, quick question that I'd like you to address live um, sure. is around the 3702 follow on uh, from a WGB perspective. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have some thoughts around that? Because um, I know people are wondering. Yeah, for sure. So um, I talked to the PMs about this uh, a few weeks ago. I said, hey, we're going to have this call. What can I share? Uh, not much was the answer. Um, but uh, I would I would probably tune in around Cisco Live. And if things pan out, we may make an announcement then. Uh, but uh, yeah, we we certainly are working on a next gen version of the IW. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things there. And, and if we but want I guess, individual conversations with people, we could certainly do like an NDA level conversation. Yeah, and just just to I guess. Um, Make sure people are okay. The 3702, it, we're not going to be end of lifeing that until we have a, re, you know, a, a yeah. replacement for it. Right. Yeah, so absolutely. that's the thing to remember. It's not like you're going to be stuck without. I know, you know, some of you are still probably recovering from our 1572 fiasco, but, uh, but in, you know, I, hopefully we've learned our lesson there. Right. I mean, we're not. We're not planning to end of life anything until the replacement is there. So you can confidently be using the 3702 at this point. Yeah, for sure. We we have line of sight for many more code releases in XE for 3702 support. So, and keep in mind, Perfect. if you're using it as a worker bridge, it's always been decoupled from the controller side of the house. So we have people running worker bridges that are like archaic in the network, but still they're still working because they're just a wireless client. It's no different than running an old laptop, right? So. Thanks, Ian, and thank you for joining this session. Join us for the next session on LoRaWAN by clicking the next video.